Greetings once again. I am Pat Dutcher Walls, the author of the study guide, God is in the Manger, Reflections at Advent on Bonhoeffer's Meditations. This short video is designed to accompany the fourth and final week of the study guide, looking at meditations by Bonhoeffer on the Incarnation. Let's again start with prayer. Lord of glory, who came as a child in the manger, as we approach ever nearer to Christmas, we seek to find you close in our hearts. Surrounded by the sounds and trimmings of the season, we get distracted by many things. Help us to draw near to you as you revealed yourself to be, a tiny child born in poverty and vulnerability so that even the least of us would find hope and healing in you. Accompany us through our Advent study of Bonhoeffer's words, that we might greet the joy of Christmas with deeper understanding and trust in your goodness. Amen. Bonhoeffer's Advent meditations have been developing an understanding of the Incarnation throughout these four weeks. In this final week of Advent, as we prepare for the birth of the Christ child, the meditations focus our hearts and minds on God truly becoming human in Jesus. However, Bonhoeffer insists that the humanity that God takes on in Jesus is not a story of triumph and power, but a tale of humility and wretchedness. In Meditation 3 this week we read, God had seen the misery of the world and had come himself in order to help. Now he was there, not as a mighty one, but in the obscurity of humanity, where there is sinfulness, weakness, wretchedness, and misery in the world. That is where God goes. And there he lets himself be found by everyone. Again, Bonhoeffer picks up the theme of the great reversal, wherein God's becoming in Jesus turns the priority and status of the world upside down. As he says, God puts to shame the most powerful human efforts and accomplishments and meets us when we kneel down before this miserable manger, before this child of poor people. This understanding of the Incarnation as God truly becoming human and taking on humility and suffering for our sake is rooted in the Gospels, of course. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus teaches his disciples about the surprising nature of his mission as he lays aside the glory of divinity to take up the cross. In Mark 9, we read, They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples and saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. The last becoming first teaching here ties directly into the theme of turning over human expectations. In the decades of growth of the early church, the Apostle Paul uses this theme of the Incarnation in his letters to young churches through his mission to the Gentiles. 
In the first letter to the Corinthian church, he uses a theology of the cross to confront the self-importance of his audience with a bit of upside-down reversals of their expectations. Paul writes in chapter 1, Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Bonhoeffer wrote and lived this understanding of the Incarnation in the context of the Nazi regime, a contact, context which brings into stark contrast his words about God taking on human nature. Even in the face of Hitler's evil, Bonhoeffer writes in the first meditation this week, God took on humanity in bodily fashion. God raised his love for human beings above every reproach of falsehood and doubt and uncertainty by himself entering into the life of human beings. At a time in 1940, when the Third Reich had banned him from all public speaking, Bonhoeffer said in a privately circulated Christmas sermon, it really is beyond all our understanding. The birth of a child shall bring about the great change, shall bring to all humankind salvation and deliverance. As we have noted before, this understanding of the incarnation has direct implication for the life of Christians and Christians living in the world. Bonhoeffer writes, when God's son took on flesh, he truly and bodily took on, out of pure grace, our being, our nature, ourselves. Now we are in him. Where he is, there we are too, in the incarnation, on the cross, and in his resurrection. That is why the scriptures call us the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, we are to live Christ's incarnation as human beings, that is, as the church. We ourselves live out the meaning of the incarnation. This first means we live a life of discipleship being with and for others, and joining in the actions of the great reversal by giving up our arrogance and acting responsibly in the world to love our neighbor. Living in this way as disciples, as Christian community, is also the means by which we present to the world the ever-renewed incarnation of Christ. As always with Bonhoeffer, his theology was lived out in his own life. This was never more true than in his final two years in prison under the Nazis. As one scholar notes, everything he had said previously about the church, about life as a disciple of Jesus and the reality of God, was now being put to the test. He recognized this at the beginning of his imprisonment, and it guided his life all the way until his death on April 9, 1945. Such awareness makes even more poignant a letter 
He wrote from prison in June 1944, less than a year before his death. In this letter, in the face of the worst trials of his own life, he writes about the incarnational ethics of Christian life in and for the world that God loves. He says, God does not repay evil for evil, and thus the righteous should not do so either. No judgment, no abuse, but blessing. The world would have no hope if this were not the case. The world lives by the blessing of God and of the righteous, and thus has a future. Blessing means laying one's hand on something and saying, despite everything, you belong to God. This is what we do with the world that inflicts such suffering upon us. We do not abandon it. We do not repudiate, despise, or condemn it. Instead, we call it back to God. We give it hope. We lay our hand on it and say, May God's blessing come upon you. May God renew you. Be blessed, world created by God, you who belong to your creator and redeemer. Those who you have blessed can do nothing but pass on this blessing. Indeed, they must be a blessing wherever they are. As I did for the final study guide chapter, I do for this final video. I share the charge and benediction I have used throughout my vocation as a teacher and a preacher. In it, we hear echoes of the incarnational theology of Bonhoeffer, and thus it becomes a fitting blessing for our Advent meditations. Now go out in this world in peace. Be of good cheer. Hold fast to that which is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, heal the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>